Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is the second day of the sixth HOPE meeting. Let me introduce the moderator for this session. Dr. Takuji Okamoto, Associate Professor of the University of Tokyo. Dr. Okamoto, please come. So the session will be the lecture by uh, Professor uh, Ekvist. Professor Ekvist is the uh, uh, plant physiologist. And his specialty is the uh, uh, photosynthesis under extreme conditions such as uh, low temperatures and uh, uh, under um, intense light exposure. He also served as a permanent secretary to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences between 2003 and 2010. You may not know this, but uh, uh, this is the awarding body of Nobel Prizes. Uh, so he knows a lot about the details of uh, prize giving and selecting the knowledge and so on. Um, Professor Ekupist has attended the HOPE meeting uh, so far uh, three times. This is the fourth time for him. Uh, it was in March 2011 that he attended the HOPE meeting for the first time. And during that meeting, as you know, he, exper he experienced that huge earthquake in this particular hotel where you are sitting now. So despite this um, supposedly hard experience, he bravely came back to Japan to attend HOPE meetings for following three years. And today, luckily, he will give us a lecture titled um, Fostering Excellence in Research. Uh, please. Well, thank you very much, Professor Okamoto, for the introduction. Yes, it was a shocking uh, event uh, three years ago on the 11th of, uh, of March uh, when we had this uh, earthquake, and I remember it so well because when the shaking came, everybody became paralyzed. And I remember myself, I, I thought the ceiling will come down. And I looked up, but the ceiling seemed to hold up. And then we were all, all ordered to get under the table and, and seek protection. Uh, so it was a shocking event, definitely. Well, uh, today I'm going to talk, uh, the title is Fostering Excellence in Research. So I'm not really going to talk science today. I'm going to talk about, about science. And, and uh, we'll talk about science policy issues. That, that may be issues that you haven't thought all that much uh, about yourself because you're, you're relatively young and, and new in the game. But I think it's important that you start to reflect on these things because I think it, it's quite relevant for you to think of when you plan your future. Uh, career. I have uh, uh, made an outline. Uh, I will start to talk about some unprecedented challenges uh, for mankind as an introduction. Then I will talk about the nature of scientific research, not methodology, it's more uh, sort of conceptual how uh, things are initiated. I will focus mainly on what I would call drivers for excellence here in research. It's enough knowledge so you know how to organize uh, ground, uh, an environment for groundbreaking research, and it's surprising that it's not done more often in our countries. And then I will finish by talking about uh, the Nobel Prizes and how we work uh, uh, with the, in, in, in a Nobel awarding institution. I will uh, take the picture of the globe to look upon when, when I say a few words about unprecedented challenges. Because I think it's fair to say that in our knowledge-based societies of today, we emphasize the use of research and innovation for, for what I would call wealth creations. When we talk about uh, uh, wealth in this context, uh, we usually think of, of uh, uh, economic 
uh, growth uh, on sort of competitive global market. But I think it's quite clear that the challenge goes well beyond that. It is really about the sustainable future for the world, or for a growing world population. The global threats that we see, they are enormous, and we all know about the climate change issue. But that is only one expression of the today increasing and devastating over-exploitation of, of planet, planet Earth. And all this has a global dimension. It goes beyond national borders. And it has a magnitude that never, bef uh, that uh, mankind never have experienced before. I think it's fair to say that today we do not have the technical or social solutions to these, these, these problems, these challenges. But I'm pretty sure that it will be societies that emphasize research for new discoveries, new ideas, and new innovations. Such societies will foster the kind of ingenuity or creativity that is necessary to find rational solutions to these uh, problems. So societies that will emphasize research and innovation with a focus on excellence and pioneering discoveries for the benefit of mankind. Such societies give us hope for the future. And as a researcher, I like to think that research really is something that gives us hope for the future. And I think history has shown that that is, uh, uh, that is correct. Before I move on and start to discuss drivers of excellence for research, I would, as I said, say, like to say a few words about the nature of scientific research. And that is more in concept on how research is initiated. And I think this is something for you to reflect on uh, for your future career. During the 90s, uh, I was Secretary General of the Natural Science Research Council in Sweden. And every year we published a book uh, uh, on a sp specific theme. And one year the uh, title of the book uh, in free translation was uh, The Beautiful Tool of Mathematics. This is something our mathematicians like to formulate a lot. But in the book, mathematics is defined both as a useful tool and a beautiful art. And I think these two definitions very well summarizes the dual nature of scientific research. It is a tool to solve problems, to focus research efforts towards identified needs, needs for new knowledge with the objective of finding new solutions of technical or social nature. We used to talk about need motivated or strategic research but sometimes we may even have a particular application in mind, and then we use the term targeted or, or applied research. This kind of research is today often financed through national programs, and they are defined more or less top-down and uh, uh, considered to be of strategic importance. Sometimes they are narrowly defined, sometimes they are more broadly defined. But uh, scientific research as a beautiful art emphasizes what I would say the more rebellious nature of independence with the individual freedom to challenge and question established views, to look into new paths into the future and in that way open for new opportunities. opportunities that cannot be predicted or even imagined and definitely not be a, 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 a ground for, for directed research. These kind of research must be given the trust and the freedom to explore and question without any other reason than to open up for new knowledge and understanding. And I'm convinced that no society can over time 
excel in scientific research without encouraging this kind of freedom, the freedom of thought, questioning, and expression. We talk, when we talk about this kind of research, we talk about blue sky research, curiosity-driven research, or we may some, sometimes use the term uh, basic research. These two uh, nature of scientific research, depending on how the research efforts are initiated, formulated top-down to solve problems or bottom-out without any other restriction than the individual intellectual uh, uh, capacity and uh, curiosity. These two, of course, overlap. And no sharp lines can be or should drawn between the two, two types because they are, in fact, interdependent of each other. And as a matter of fact, many scientists uh, like to have one foot in each domain. These two uh, sort of nature of scientific research, they do not differ in their systematic uh, search for understanding. The methodology, as we heard about yesterday by Professor Smith, the methodology is very much the same. And both can be of produce research of high quality. But I think that they are defined by different degrees of freedom to choose questions and topics to address. And therefore, they are complementary to each other. And I think in order to, to really exploit the full potential, you need to have both these operational modes in place. And I think it, that it blurs the picture if you don't recognize this, because over time, top-down and bottom-up formulated research, they, work, they will work with different goals. Again, they are dependent on each other, and together they, 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 they fill the whole spectrum. Well, uh, it's also quite clear that the political interest for, for research and innovation has never in history been as, as high as it is today. And there, there are different reasons to this, and I've mentioned three here. There is an increasing political expectation that research and innovation will create prosperity and health. And we talk about uh, knowledge-based economies in order to sort of uh, summarize this. There is in our society a, a call for evidence-based decisions in different sectors of the society, and this is important. And as I mentioned, we have increased global challenges that demand new solutions. We have an increasing population, we have over-exploitation, we have uh, various environmental issues health issues. All this has consequences. And the consequence is that today, the political systems, as we see it in Europe and also worldwide, primarily view research as a tool to solve problems. And they formulate this in, in strategic national research programs. This kind of development is also coupled to an increased demand for deliver deliverables and also social accountability. This is all well motivated. But such research effort and, and such a, a strong focus has a weakness because it's formulated largely within the framework of established paradigm. And it reduces risk taking and it nurtures safe and rather specialized research in order to meet requirements in a foreseeable time. In order to describe the situation today and as it has developed up to now, I also think that it's, uh, we, we need to recognize that when we look around, there is a tremendous, what I would call bandwagon effect, where thousands of scientists all around the world flock around similar questions 
defined by very similar research strategies set at national levels. And this has resulted in what we call incremental research uh, with relatively low risk. Such research is characterized by high competition between researchers, high productivity, and also relatively high quality of data, I would say. But the data has a relatively short best before date. Most of us do incremental research because that's what the financial system usually support. The room for high-risk, long-term challenging science with the potential to make real breakthroughs in research has been steadily shrinking up to now. And I think it's, what is needed now is a rebalancing between incremental science with short to medium term perspectives towards more challenging groundbreaking research uh, with longer time perspectives. Uh, and I think that is actually needed in view of societal needs and in order to optimize the role of research in the societies. So in other words, I think our best scientists must be given the trust, resources, and the freedom to take risk and address more demanding questions. And that's why we must strengthen the conditions for those who want and have the capacity to pursue independent, I would call basic research of the highest extinction, aiming at making real breakthroughs in terms of discoveries and new understanding. Address difficult but important questions. I think we need scientists today that look in new directions. Uh, I think this is a, the HOPE meeting is a very good example. We have Nobel laureates here. We listen to Nobel laureates uh, uh, during this meeting. And I think our Nobel laureates, they are an eminent example of scientists who have looked in new directions and therefore open up for new discoveries. Discoveries that were not foreseen discoveries that also had changed the way we think about things. To me, we need a definition of excellence. To me, uh, uh, the level of excellence in research is defined by the richness of consequences that follow from new discoveries, a scientific or technical breakthrough that opens up for new opportunities for science, technology, or the society at large. So it's the riches of consequences of the outcome of research that defines uh, the level of excellence. And I'm, I will come back to that a little bit later when I talk about the Nobel Prize. So what kind of policy is required to increase the probability of scientific breakthroughs? Is it more research organized through a strategic, targeted, top-down organized program? Or is it in the development of more environments where individuals are given the bottom-up freedom to pioneer in the pursuit of their own ideas. To me, the answer is very clear. Today, we need to better exploit the individual freedom, the human mind and creativity to foster more or groundbreaking excellence in research. So then, what are the drivers for excellence in research? What I have talked about is observation about the global trends up to now. But I'm happy to say, to notice that today there is a growing increase, uh, growing interest in these questions on how to foster more of transformative research that can open up for new opportunities. And it is clear, it's clear that the quest for scientific excellence it has become something that is discussed nowadays in scientific institutions. And I think in some countries, it's also reached uh, the national policy levels. A couple of weeks ago, I attended the American Association for the Advancement of Science Conference in Chicago. And I participated in a session there on the theme, Global Excellence, New Drivers for Innovative, innovative Solutions. Uh, 
And the question asked in that session was why the issue of excellence in research has started to become an issue for scientific institutions primarily. The global challenges, as I mentioned initially, are of course strong drivers uh, in the call for excellence as we face more and more complex questions to, to address scientifically. But I think we need to add uh, the various glo global benchmarking systems that we have. This is a system by which the success of research institutions and national research policies uh, uh, um, are assessed at the global level. And, and you know, you see them as university ranking system, public publication impact analysis, counting a number of patents and so on. A lot can be said uh, about the effects of this ranking system. But I think it has put the finger on, on how do you foster excellence and how do you become a world leading uh, university or an institute when it comes to, to research. And I think that is an important effect of this, this uh, ranking system. However, I think that there is also another reason why we today emphasize excellence in research at the global scale. And that is that there is actually a growing awareness that top-down targeted research programs to solve problems, they do not deliver as expected or as hoped. And I think there is a growing ins insight, and at least hope there is a growing insight, that for true transformative research to open up for new opportunity, irrespective of being formulated top down or bottom up, I would say, that requires a different focus, namely mining the multitude of individual ideas, talents, and creativity. And I think this is very important to emphasize in an occasion like this because renewal of science is constantly built on new generation of scientists that come in and ask new questions, questions that the older generation didn't think of. And I think that's extremely important to emphasize. So there were particularly three perspectives that were emphasized at this AAA meet, uh, S meeting in the US. One was to foster excellence. You really need to pay attention to recruitment and career opportunities for young young people. It has to be in, in, internationally competitive recruitment and career opportunities to be offered. And that should really be at the top of the agenda of an, for an academic uh, leadership at universities and research institutions. So I think it came down that the most important thing of an academic leadership is to see to that recruitment and career opportunities are the best policy, uh, possible. Uh, uh, and I have many examples to sh show that those who, who focus on this recruitment and career issues, they become, those institutions become also world leader. There was also discussion about granting agencies. Granting agencies should more than now give generous funding of people, often young people, people with novel ideas. That should be the only criterion for funding. So more risk taking, a better payoff when it comes to real breakthroughs in research. In Europe, we have two very shining good examples when this is, is uh, strategy is used. It's the European Research Council. It's a success for Europe. But it's also a funding organization in Denmark that really has helped lift Denmark's impact of Danish research to a, a top level internationally. So there are good examples that granting agency can make a difference in this respect. And of course, then there are many uh, possibilities of making concerted actions between research institutions and granting agencies. And what we have seen is a number of international examples where they establish center of excellence and to foster research at the groundbreaking level. But it's, it's, it's very clear that when we compare this center of excellence investments in Europe 
the centers that during the last 10 years have been established top down, they are less successful than the centers that has been built around individuals with great ideas that then have been allowed to assemble what is needed to address the difficult questions. These are examples that are uh, developments that are noticed. So the main mess, uh, mess, uh, message from that meeting was drivers for excellence are people with novel ideas. It's, it's, it's not really uh, all that new for us, but I think it's important to emphasize still because I don't think it's realized and, and paid attention to enough in science policy. We also had a European Union conference in uh, Denmark in 2012 when uh, the Danish government had the, the presidency for EU. And that conference came up with five criteria that you have to consider if you want to foster excellence in research. That was, again, recognizing uh, nurturing talents recognize young people and give them good opportunities. It was trust and freedom. It was long-term perspectives. If you want to address a difficult question, it's not just a question of money. It's a question of giving enough time to pursue challenging research. What's also uh, emphasized is the environment, create a dynamic research environment. I'm coming back to that. And then beyond and across disciplines. Problems cross disciplinary borders. And uh, I think this will be emphasized at this meeting also, that it's an interdisciplinary meeting. Uh, I myself had the opportunities uh, in 2012 to uh, chair a, a study set up by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And the title of this study was Fostering Breakthrough Research, a Comparative Study. And the study was motivated by the funding that Swedish research, although performing uh, quite well uh, and is in, in, in high, when we look at high impact publications across all fields, it's performing 15% about uh, world average. But we also found that Sweden was falling behind nations like Denmark, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. These countries perform at a level of 35 to 40 percent above world average. It's at the same uh, level as the US today. This is something we didn't want to recognize, and that was why the academy tried to look deeper into, into it. And the idea behind the study was to take a 20-year perspective back in time, looking at priority setting at national levels, governance of universities and how that had developed, and direction and, uh, of funding of research over this historical period. And we found much larger differences between nations uh, than we had assumed when we started uh, the study. And there were three aspects that really stood out uh, and where we saw significant differences. <laughs> the most, more successful universities, and I would say the more successful uh, policy system in countries, they gave actually better support to individuals with new ideas. It was also clear that the more successful countries, there the universities were able to provide better career opportunities for young scientists and they have a very open international recruitment system. So the more focus on international recruitment. That was the three main differences that we could see explain the difference uh, in performance. And behind all this was then what we also elaborated on, that is a need for academic leadership. And it was interesting that when you talk to the more successful universities, the leaders, the presidents, vice chancellors, you ask, what's your most important task? And the answer were always clear. That is to see to that recruitment uh, 
is at a, at a high levels, measured by international standards. So what these studies showed uh, is uh, that it's really important to give good support to individuals with novel ideas. And it emphasized the importance to allow and encourage young scientists to pursue their own ideas. This came up very often. It also emphasized that research today is an international business. And you, as young scientists, now actually can look for the best research opportunities around the world. This report we made is in English, and you can download it from the page of the Academy. Now over to us, uh, a few words about uh, research environments. Uh, professor Hollingworth is a sociologist and is a professor at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And he has analyzed systematically how major breakthroughs in biomedical science and chemistry are either facilitated or hampered by the organizational context within which they occur. And the material he has used is more than 100 years of uh, uh, studying what kind of environments favor repeatedly uh, uh, an, a, an environment that produces Nobel laureates. Um, which environments do not produce Nobel laureates? So I think he has pretty solid data. And he has listed uh, five or organizational concepts uh, that he says facilitate the making of major discoveries, highest excellence in research. One is scientific diversity. He says, you need to bring together interactive sub-disciplines highly carried by highly qualified individuals. They should be at the forefront of using new technologies. You need to bring together theoreticians as well as ex experimentalists. Scientific diversity in, a in an environment. Second, communication and integration. You have to bring together people with different cognitive perspectives. They have to create strong interactions between these people, think of journal clubs, lunches together, social interactions. These are also important to sort of get a creative dialogue going. He emphasized leadership capacity. And a leader needs to have a strategic vision for integrating these uh, different knowledges, different areas, and, and, and get a discussion going on how to to, 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 to use this to focus research on new challenging topics. The leader must secure long-term funding. And again, the leader must think all the time of, on recruitment to build these environments, to foster a critical and nurturing environment. And the leadership should really focus on taking all possible steps to foster quality in research. He also points at the need for adaptiveness. The way to process new knowledge among actors from different fields in order to open for new ideas. You, you have to be open to new ideas and sort of bring that into a discussion in order to develop your thoughts. And finally, organizational flexibility. He says that if an organization starts to idle, you need to regroup and go for more important, challenging questions. So there are mechanisms to build creative environments. While organizational concept hampering the making of major discoveries can also be defined from his studies. And he says differentiation, that's a problem. Too much fragmentation into disciplines with sharp boundaries. Uh, he also said too much delegation to sublevels with two narrow pers perspectives. Recruitment cannot be delegated to, too low. It has to be at the level that has sort of an overview. 
hierarchical authority. You need to avoid centralized decision making about research programs, budget allocation and personnel. And I, I think it's fair to say that hierarchic academic systems, they work against scientific renewal. Bureaucratic conditions, rigid bureaucracy is a killer. Hyperdiversity, that means that we can't talk to each other any longer. And I, and I think in many envi environments, the specialization has gone so far, so uh, the communication is actually falling apart. And I'm afraid that many universities have de developed in, in this direction. And this uh, hampers uh, new discoveries. I should skip that one and I can say a few words about uh, mobility. Mobility is really a cornerstone for stimulating creativity, bringing people with different experience from different parts of the world. And it's really a, a cornerstone uh, also when we look at uh, uh, achievements at a Nobel level. We have a person, Olav Tuvetson, he made a PhD thesis in, at Lund University and he studied the mobility among Nobel laureates and he find that on average a Nobel laureate has worked in 4.6 different environments, universities or institutes before receiving a Nobel Prize. Isn't that amazing? And in addition, a Nobel laureate has on average had 7.4 other Nobel laureates as colleagues during a career. I think we can say that this shows that research environments, they are contagious when it comes to, 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 to you know, fostering research at the level that can be awarded by the Nobel Prize. So the take home message uh, uh, of what I have been said here uh, to foster excellence in research is that people with novel ideas, exchange of knowledge and ideas in an environment with complementary skills, they are key element for shaping creative environments that are brave enough to address important groundbreaking questions. Also having a fair chance to make discoveries, innovations and improvements that may merit for a Nobel Prize. People with novel ideas are the strongest driver for excellence in research. And I would say this is irrespective of the research being formulated top down or bottom up. Okay, now over uh, to the last part of my talk uh, and it's about the Nobel Prize. Alfred Nobel lived between 1833 and 1896. He died December 10, that today is what we call the Nobel Day. There are four Nobel Prize awarding institutions. It's my own academy, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. We are in charge of the Nobel Prize in Physics and Prize in Chemistry. In 69, uh, Alfred Nobel Memorial Prize was added. It's called the Riksbankens, Sales Riksbanks Prize, Prize in Memory of Alfred Nobel. It's an economy prize. It's not a true Nobel Prize, uh, although it belongs to the family. That we have the Nobel Assembly at Karolinska Institute. Uh, they are in charge of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. We have the Swedish Academy, Nobel Prize in Literature, and we have the Norwegian. Nobel Committee, the Nobel Peace Prize. You sometimes hear that the Nobel Foundation has awarded a Nobel Prize. That's absolutely wrong. The Nobel Foundation does not award any Nobel Prizes. It is these institutions that award the Nobel Prizes. The Nobel Foundation was set up to look after the endowment. And together we work in the Nobel Foundation in order to make the prize ceremony and uh, the 
banquet. So I, I, I think it might surprise you that when I called Martin Chelfi and said that he had received a Nobel Prize, the Nobel Foundation didn't know about that you were a laureate. They learn about it at the same moment as we go public with the information. So that really emphasized that this is the prize awarding institution, not the foundation. Alfred Nobel, he wrote a will and it looked like this. He wrote it by hand. And what Alfred Nobel really did, and I think this is important for you now when you discuss, we discuss science meets society. He really emphasized uh, uh, the role of research for the society, for mankind. And he says, prices should go to those who during the preceding year, we well, skipped that preceding year, but that's what's in the will, shall have come for the greatest benefit to mankind. And I think this is very important. And I think the highest quality criteria, if you think of consequences of a discovery, for example, in the long term, that is really defined by what it means to, to mankind. So it's actually the public at large that defines scientific quality. We as scientists may, on the way towards a discovery, has proved its, its usefulness, be interpreter. But it, it's re the outcome is really what it means to mankind. And Alfred Nobel, he, he, he realized this more than 100 years ago. When it comes to physics, two persons shall have made the most important discovery or invention. When it comes to chemistry, most important chemical discovery or improvement. And when it comes to physiology and medicine, person shall have made the most important discovery within the domain, and, and so on. And I skipped the, the other. So what you should notice here, it's not a lifetime achievement that is awarded by the Nobel Prize. It's a discovery, invention, or improvement. And I also think it's fair to say that it's really a focused on, on the results. That is what, what is in the, the, the core of the, the, the work of the, of the prize awarding institutions. So when we have found a discovery, invention, or improvement that merits for a Nobel Prize, then we look for the people who made the key contribution to make that possible. And again, come for the greatest benefit to mankind. I think that's the highest international quality criteria by, by uh, any uh, comparison. So how do we identify groundbreaking contribution on those who made them? Well, the, most of the work of a, of a prize committee is to make field reviews with focus on major breakthroughs in terms of discovery, innovation, and improvement. This work, work goes on the year around. And the, the committees, prize committees, they use all possible expertise uh, around the world in order to make this field review. So one is observant on how different subfields of chemistry or physics is, is developing. Uh, ready to, to sort of consider a price when a really breakthrough is emerging. Then we have the nomination process, and we send out some 3,000 letters to members of the academies, to early Nobel laureates, to leading scientists around the world, and to leading institutions, asking for nominations to come in. And then the third, we match the nomination with these field reviews that, that we do. And I would say there is no institution in the world, in physics or chemistry, that has such a good compiled understanding of where uh, the edge of the research is standing in different subfields as our Nobel committees. This is the working procedure. In September, uh, we, we send out letters for nomination deadline for submission is in February. And then March through May, it's really a consultation with experts identifying the fields that, uh, where there happened important things and that might be considered mature for a prize. During the summer, June, August, the prize committees uh, start to 
write on their report. During this process, uh, at regular intervals, the discussions are open to a broader audience of the Academy. In September, it's pretty clear that uh, the committee has a, a, a suggestion to the Academy. And uh, then in October, we make the final decision. And the prize ceremony is on the 10th of December. So a Nobel Prize contribution, it should have opened new doors in science. And it should have wide consequences, scientifically, technically, or socially. And notice there are no national considerations whatsoever. So why have the Nobel Prizes become so prestigious? I think there are many reasons to that. One is that it has had time to establish itself. It was the first international prize established uh, in 1895 through the will, and the first prize was handed out in 1901. It was interesting at that time, the Swedish king, he was very much against making this prize an international prize. In those days, Science was not so international, but Alfred Nobel was a real internationalist, and he saw and emphasized that it had to be an international prize. I think we can also say the quality of the prize work through, through history, and also the fact that it is so great emphasis on consequences for mankind as added to the, 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 the prestigiousness of the prize. Of course, it's the quality of the Nobel laureates. It's a recognition uh, of the prize through their achievements. I also think it's, it's important to emphasize the broad spectrum. It's science, it's medicine, it's literature, it's peace. Almost all sectors of societies have an interest in these issues, and that make it sort of penetrate the society very well. And I think it's fair to say, if you, for example, want to make, uh, write the history of chemistry and physics or medicine, you can very much write it through the achievements that have been awarded by the Nobel Prize. So the, the, the Nobel Prize is actually make up the textbooks. We have good outreach activities that has developed over time. Media coverage is good, and also the global glory uh, is uh, important here because it's a broad public interest, award ceremony, and the banquet is followed publicly. Now I have a couple of slides here showing uh, the events. This is a prize awarding ceremony. Here are the Nobel laureates of, of the year. People behind are either earlier Nobel laureates or uh, members of prize committees or the Nobel Foundation. The royal family is sitting there. Some pictures on, on recipients. Uh, Professor Kubayashi, Professor Shelfi, Professor Negeshi, and Professor Schmidt when they received their Nobel Prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. Uh, we have a banquet after in the, in the city hall, and this is the long table, this is the high table. And uh, it's about 1,400 guests, and they are served three uh, dishes, three courses, in three hours. And in between there are intermissions with, uh, with some entertainment. Uh, I should say that in the academy, we are very often visited by, by other prize awarding organizations asking us how we do it, how can the, can we, what can we do to become as successful or recognized as the Nobel Prize. And of course, we share our experience with, with, uh, with anybody who, who, who want to have our view on this. So I want to conclude uh, this lecture by referring to what an earlier Nobel laureate has said. 
yeah, because I think it summarizes very much what I have said, and I think it's a message to you people who are young. And it was Professor Venkatrama Ramakrishnan, who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2009, who has written this in his autobiography in the pre Nobel. He works at the laboratory in Cambridge, the Medical Research Council uh, uh, Laboratory for Molecular Biology. Uh, and this is a very well known. Uh, environment after 1945, I think it's produced by now 50 Nobel laureates in chemistry or physiology or medicine. So it's an, one of these environments that really repeatedly produce Nobel laureates. What Venkatrama Ramakrishnan emphasizes here is he describes the lunchroom on the fifth floor as a meeting place for new thoughts and ideas in a relaxed atmosphere. And he rem told me that when he came there the first time, he was asked by a colleague, shouldn't you come up to the fifth floor for lunch? And he said, no, I don't really have time. But then he understood that was the wrong answer. If it's anything you should prioritize is to go to that lunch room and have that da daily interaction with other colleagues in the environment. So that is more or less a pressure on everybody to participate in that. But then he writes, and, uh, and I've taken this from his autobiography. There were two other important lessons I learned at the, the laboratory of molecular biology. I found that almost nobody there was working on routine problems just because they would lead to publishable results. Rather, they were trying to ask the most interesting questions in their fields and then developing ways to address them. First the questions, then to set up the system to address them. The other lesson was that even very famous scientists would ask questions at seminars that were often trivial to people in the field. It reinforced in me the feeling that ignorance is not something to be ashamed of, and no question is too stupid to ask if you want to know the answer. Think what kind of environment this develops uh, for creative research. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Erkvist. Uh, Two-thirds of the uh, uh, Professor Erkvist talk was about the, uh, uh, how to foster, how to nurture creativity in research field, and one-third is about Nobel Prize. Um, now we still have some time for you. Um, now, I could probably say that no question is too stupid to ask if you want to know the answer. <laughs> please feel free to raise your hand if you have comments. Yes, please. Thank you. Wonderful lecture. Thank you. But with the regard to what you mentioned about the aspects of institutions that really facilitate excellence in research and those which hamper it, in those cases where the attributes of a particular institution might not be the best, what does it take to actually change that environment, to really form it into something greater? Yeah. Well, the, I think this is uh, the, the real challenge. Because if we think of universities, universities in many countries has developed to be, from being rather elitistic settings, to being mass universities for, for, for education, uh, a large number of education, often professional educations. Uh, research endeavor has, it has be also been broadened. Uh, it's, in my own country, it's everything from developmental projects in the regional interest uh, where the university is situation 
to you know, international cutting edge research. That's whole breadth. And if you look at the faculty today, professors, they represent that whole spectrum. And I, I, I simply think that in such an environment as our university has been developing, there are so many needs and very often conflicting goals within the university. So one have lost, one cannot maintain the focus on scientific excellence in research at the level we have been talking about here. And I think this is a, a, a challenge, how to combine the role of the, a mass university with these elitistic requirements that we now emphasize in this uh, global uh, uh, development. And I tell you, Swedish universities are extremely surprised when they come low on international ranking. But it's, it's obvious, Swedish university has too many obligations and they cannot maintain enough focus on, on scientific quality as it is today. And this is the critical thing. Uh, I, don't, I think there are ways to solve it, but I, I, I think uh, um, that this has to be brought up to international discussions as a guidance on, on best practice. I think we will see developments here because no university that has ambitions will be low on this ranking. They will do something to, to raise. Thank you. Next time, to, yeah, yes. Um, the question is also on the creativeness of the uh, environment. Um, uh, I'm wondering if the study also samples the institutes in Asian area, like for, uh, especially Japan. Because uh, in my experience, I think in Japan, uh, institute and laboratory, the uh, professor has more power to the students and the senior student has more power than uh, junior students. So I think it's a more of a Asian culture so, but Japan has achieved such a excellence in the academic um, triumphs. So I'm trying to understand if this hierarchical author, uh, authority, how does it affect the creativeness of this area? Yeah, is the question of comparing research institutes with universities or? Uh, um, the environment. So oh, you, you, you listed some keynotes like uh, hierarchical, like authority, yeah. and right. well, I think uh, uh, in, in Asian case, in Asian countries, we, we see cultures, a cultural hierarchy in the society that is reflected in many universities, and I think this is a challenge for you. You have to do something about this. That that's for clear. I, I, I have had many discussions with the Japanese ambassador in Sweden on these issues, and he said, can you give us advice on this issue? How to break this in our academic environment? So I think there is a discussion going on. I think it has to be aware of it, because there is one a hierarchical system can, of course, be very fruitful if you have a leader who really has that capacity. To, to, to take that responsibility. But I think hierarchical structures really undermine stability for new thoughts coming from the younger generation. And I think as societies develop uh, today, uh, I think renewal of science has to depend a lot of young people coming in, asking new questions, pursuing their own ideas. If we don't have that mechanism going, so a role of a, of, of a leader is to give room for this, for young, young generation. I think a regular system is often a hindrance for that. It's something to work on. Would you like to hear more about the Japanese hierarchical system? <laughs> we, we have a bunch of uh, Japanese professors and Japanese lawyers. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you can leave it for lunchtime, yes. Please go to lunch room. Yes, and uh, uh, probably we have uh, some time for maybe two questions. Okay, please, uh, and last one. Yes, you please. Yes. Sorry. 
Sir, why the Nobel Prize is not awarded in the subject of mathematics? Uh, can you repeat that? Why? Mathematics is not awarded in the Nobel Prize. Why? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, th there is no real good answer for that. There, there are many speculations of why, why we don't have a, a prize in mathematics. One speculation that was Alfred Nobel and a mathematician, Gustav Mitter-Gleffler, had fallen in love in the same girl, and this girl didn't choose Alfred Nobel. <laughs> uh, she chose the other one. And that's, probably, that's probably wrong, but those kind of, of, of discussions have been around. I think maybe the, 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 it's more reasonable to think in terms of Alfred Nobel. He was really an experimentalist. He was an inventor. When he died, he had 355 patents, international patents. And just imagine how much time he had to put into defending those patents. He was an experimentalist. He was an entrepreneur. He probably wasn't all that theoretically minded. And that could be one of the reasons why he didn't favor mathematics and left that to his colleague, Gustav. Uh, just uh, 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 I can say that uh, we have a, a, a quite well uh, known mathematical uh, research institute in Sweden from the same, established at the same period, uh, named by this mathematician that was a com uh, competitor for this girl uh, with, uh, with Alfred Nobel. And the last one, okay, some uh, two are there. One with the glasses. Thank you for your lecture. I was wondering, um, what do you think? How do you think we can protect the environment of um, excellent scientific research in a constantly changing political environment, um, especially when they are so focused on fast and high turnover? Of results and especially as young scientists I think all of us can agree that um, we are the ones who are most susceptible to these political changes because we only get funding for two years maximum three years and we're constantly scrambling for a very short amount of funding um, yeah I was wondering what your thoughts are on that no, I think that is one of the big problems uh, we need to put more trust into it, into in, into science into individuals that do science and give them long term this is an international uh, a problem. I, I actually think that you as young scientists can, you know, make your voice heard on these issues. Uh, uh, in uh, many European countries, we now have a development of establishing academies for young people. You can be elected to these academies for five years and then you roll up. And it's amazing. We have set up such a, a, an academy for young people in Sweden. And it's amazing. When this young academy makes the case, arrange the meeting, for example, on these issues, long term, short term, politicians come. Politicians can never say no when young people uh, you know, speak up. But if I do it, they say, oh, you are just, you know, you know you're arguing for in, in your own interest. So it, it, I th you have a stronger voice, actually, on these matters than the older generation had. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now we are running short of time. So let us applaud again for Professor Epivis. <laughs>
you will listen and discuss about the presentation of others. The timetable that says who, when will present their posters will be posted in Matsuba room. Please check on that. Today's presenter's color is red. This program includes coffee breaks, so you feel free to drink some coffee and some snacks on the tables and make yourself comfortable. Later, from 11.40, we will have lecture four here in Aoba room. So after the poster session, come to this Aoba room and be ready for the lecture. So please go to the next room. Matsuba. Thank you.